Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the manager of programs and events at WCET. And today we're talking with Paul Stacy, and he's with Creative Commons. Paul has vast experience with open ed resources. He's the associate director of global learning at Creative Commons, and he has led large scale open educational resource initiatives across British Columbia. Thank you for joining us, Paul. So we've touched on OER and Creative Commons. Let's talk about good practices. Uh, we've done two webcasts over the past two weeks on OER, and both times the five R's of OER were referenced. And I know you introduced that to me and the WCT community last year. Um, could you please take us through the five R's and help us understand <laughs> how this is help, helping um, guide the principles around OER? Sure. Let's see if I can remember them all. This is a test for me, Megan. <laughs> um, well, so the five R's are, is a short form for a set of principles that essentially apply to what constitutes an open education resource because it became important for us to all have a shared common understanding of what we mean when we say open education resource, particularly as there are a lot of things now being called open that perhaps aren't... Um, in compliance with those five R's. So let's let's just talk. Um, so the first one, is, the first R, you might think of as reuse. So when something is Creative Commons, when an education set of materials are Creative Commons licensed, um, in addition to the creator getting attribution, there's a set of permissions being provided. And the first permission is that others are free to reuse the materials, which I think is a fundamental basic notion associated with open education resources. And then um, the, the next R is kind of about allowing people to revise a re resource. So perhaps, you know, in some fields, the, the, um, the, the discipline advances quickly. And as new knowledge emerges, the, the R about revision allows materials to be revised in real time and kept up to date and not have to be locked down and fixed in a particular format that might make the materials no longer relevant or current. Mm -hmm. And so being able to revise the materials is really an important component of OER. And then the next R refers to kind of remix, which, which is different than revise. And remix means that you can take this resource and mix it with another resource and kind of come up with a, with a kind of new combined resource that brings together two different things in a unique way. And I think that's a really, um, that one is almost in some ways more interesting than revised because it, it creates some really creative and innovative opportunities around developing new teaching and learning materials. And then um, uh, the next R has to do with redistribute. So, as we know, with digital resources especially, um, the ability to make a copy and send someone a copy of a resource is like pretty much no-brainer and, and pretty much costs really close to zero dollars. And so um, to leverage the, the benefits associated with that, the, the next R allows people to redistribute materials freely. You don't have to ask permission you're given permission as part of OER to redistribute materials. And then the fifth R really emerged actually in the last couple of years and it emerged, it's called Retain, and it emerged in response to a publisher practice of time bombing digital materials. You probably have heard of this where, you know, the, a publisher will um, make a, or a faculty member will assign a publisher's resource to students. Students pay a fee and they get digital access to that resource for a fixed period of time, perhaps while they're a student in that course. And then when they're no longer a student, it's what we call time bombed and they no longer have access to the resource. And, and that is not necessarily in the best interests of the student who may need to be able to refer to those materials in subsequent uh, courses or programs of study that they pursue. And so from an OER perspective, we've embraced the notion of retain, which is that you're free to retain a copy of the resource um, and it won't be time bombed. So those are the five R's and we think of those as being uh, sort of the underlying principles that constitute an open education resource. It may be important to also say, Megan, that it means that um, 
in the Creative Commons context, we have six different licenses, mm -hmm. and two of the licenses are uh, relate to something that we call no derivatives. Um, and so, in general, those two licenses, which prevent revision and remix, are, are not considered suitable for OER. Great. Well, during one of our webinars the other day, we had a pretty active tweet in the back channel and there was some discussion about what OER really means and mm -hmm. TJ Bliss who I'm sure you know he's with Hewlett now yeah I know he, TJ well he said it's simply open plus rights and I think that's good yeah. for us to keep in mind is it doesn't have to be complicated it doesn't have to be incredibly complex it's open plus rights I think that's I think that's a good way of saying it. I would say it's open plus permissions. And the reason I say it slightly differently is because um, sometimes with OER and sometimes with faculty, they there's confusion that in making a resource into OER that they're somehow giving up their copyright. And that is not the case. So even when a faculty member creates an education set of materials, and decides to Creative Commons license it and make it into OER, they actually continue to be the copyright holder, so they're not giving up rights. They actually are the copyright owner of those materials. But what they're giving is a set of permissions, mm -hmm. and they're expressing up front a set of permissions that downstream users have relative to those resources that don't require the downstream users to ask the copyright holder for permission. That, that's a slightly nuanced way that I would describe it. Oh, I think that's a great way of describing it. And I, with by nature, Twitter is incredibly oversimplified, <laughs> so I appreciate the background on that. Okay. Final question. If an institution is beginning to consider launching an OER initiative, either large or small scale, what are the most important things they need to consider? Um, well, this is an interesting one because, as you know, at this juncture, especially in the United States, we're seeing a significant move towards what are called Z degrees. And um, as Z degree is really, you know, the expansion of what was usually sort of a smaller scale uh, pilot, you know, early adopter kind of OER initiative at institutions into, you know, something that applies to a, an entire credential. Um, so it's much sort of larger scale. And so as we move from this kind of early adopter phase into something more mainstream where OER is kind of being done at a larger scale, it, it, it broadens the kinds of factors that we need to think about. And so I'll just throw out a few, um, and then if you want to, we can dig into any of them. But um, one factor really is what I'll call policy. So um, as we think about supporting and encouraging the development and use of OER, um, there may be the need to address policy that, that actually explicitly states in policy that that's allowed. Um, and and that, can be, that can be an enabler and it can be an important thing to consider in multiple areas of a uh, college or a university, ranging from agreements with faculty, for example, around intellectual property to purchasing agreements and um, uh, technology agreements. Uh, if you want to endorse and support OER, then you need to kind of think about what are the what are the parts of our organization that this touches, and do we need to kind of look at the policy that governs those parts and adjust that policy to allow and accommodate OER within it or even encourage OER within it. And so there is there is a policy piece. I think that there's another bigger piece around practice. Um, and by practice, I simply mean uh, how curricula is developed and then used and maintained over time. And uh, this is a really big area of impact because um, you know, earlier you were asking me about uh, faculty fearing getting engaged with OER. And I think what most faculty forget is that while they themselves are sharing, they also are the recipient of a lot of other people's sharing. And it's sort of a reciprocal uh, kind of way in which things work. And so 
when it comes to encouraging and engaging instructional designers and faculty in the process of developing courses, I think that one of the practice changes is identifying what open education resources in this area already exist that might be reusable or revisable or included in the curricula and course materials that we're creating. And that's a shift from solo authoring to a kind of um, look at what currently exists that can be incorporated rather than starting from scratch. Um, and then as, as we kind of quickly alluded to early, earlier, there's this whole notion of then how does the OER affect teaching and learning? And what are the open pedagogical practices? And how are they different from the ways in which we've taught previously? And to what extent can they significantly improve learning outcomes? And by learning outcomes, I don't just mean like a higher grade. I mean that some, you know, someone's days, that greater completion, uh, perhaps faster completion, lower cost completion. There's a whole bunch of variables there. But I think that those all can be uh, considered as part of what you might want to put in place if you're going to pursue an OER path. Great. Well, I appreciate your time today. Do you have anything else you want uh, to share? Um, well, maybe I'll just say a couple of things, Megan. I think there are um, some bigger pieces that are starting to unfold right now beyond what we've talked about. And so I'll just mention them very briefly. That's sort of food for thought for the next time we speak. Um, one piece has to do with to what extent will institutions, rather than compete with one another, form consortia and collaborate around collectively um, curating, mm -hmm and using and subsequently maintaining and improving a set of learning resources that, that they do collectively as a consortia. I think that's a very interesting a way to look at how OER might move forward. And that consortia and collective may not be simply regional, the way we've seen consortia typically formed in the past. We might see consortia formed that is national or even international. And, and those consortia could then engage in curatorial practices that are mutually beneficial around OER. I think while that's not necessarily happening in a big way right now, I see that as a direction um, that will emerge and become apparent and uh, be incorporated into OER initiatives. And then I just want to personally mention that an area that I'm currently digging into is something I'm calling open business models. Um, I'm doing this with my colleague Sarah Pearson. Uh, we Kickstarter funded a, a book that would look at open business models around Creative Commons. Because one of the fundamental questions that always gets asked is, if we're going to take materials and Creative Commons license them and make them freely available to others, if there was a revenue generation component to those materials in the past, what do we do? How are we going to sustain ourselves if we're giving away things for free? Mm -hmm. And so um, we've actually um, been interviewing, we're interviewing 24 different organizations around the world who already do this and have a sustainable business practice around this. And we're asking them to share their model and to describe how they do this and why, in some cases, it's incredibly beneficial, not only for them, but of course for their users. And um, it's been really fascinating work that I hope actually will help everyone in the education sector understand that open education resources doesn't mean that they know, you know, that they as a as a institution or as a system somehow jeopardize their sustainability. That's that's a very good point. I know when I worked at an institution, the library was one of two auxiliary fund funded sources. So considering textbooks was a significant revenue generator, that could dramatically impact that college's ability and sustainability. However, mm -hmm. I also think that we need to be innovative and, and evolve. They need to look at their business practices and evolve at the times. Many, many bookstores have had to figure out how to stay viable in the, in the day and age of Amazon. Sure. 
Yeah. So it's a so this is another another area of work that I'm involved in that I'm finding pretty interesting. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say is that uh, uh, I'm also working on the creation of a Creative Commons certificate for educators. And so as as Creative Commons and its use becomes more prevalent within education, it's become apparent that there needs to be some program that faculty, instructional designers, teachers, support staff can take to familiarize themselves with the full spectrum of knowledge and skills associated with Creative Commons use and it's in the way that it's used for open education resources. So, so we've actually uh, taken on the initiative to create such a program uh, which, which, we'll, which we're hoping will be available um, next year.